Welcome to Exhumed, an underground retrospective of arts and culture in the late 20th century. I'm your host, James Wallace, and tonight we look at Marky e. Smith and the Fall. Dissonant rockabilly dirge begins, off time and out of tune. The rhythm repeats both to hypnotize and to irritate. Over this cacophony, the vocals begin. This is a rant. A rant that is a stream of consciousness diatribe in a Manchester working class slang. Each line ends with an emphasized ah. A chorus repeats, which is shouted. The band themselves stay in a rigid position, performing these jagged rhythms. They wear thrift store sweaters, golf shirts, and khakis. There is no flair or image here, no glamour. This is Andy Cap as a rock band. The contradictions are everywhere, especially in the lyrics. Mundane observations of working class life are juxtaposed with surreal flights of fancy, grotesque magic realism, sarcastic tirades, and a love for 50s rock and roll. The front man announces to the audience, We are... The Fall. How The Fall became my favorite band was an interesting process. In my late teens, I would read magazines like Alternative Press and voraciously consume the reviews. I always wanted to see how a band's sound would be referenced in relation to another band's sound. Occasionally, a review would state, the singer would rant like a more relaxed Marquis e. Smith, or they have a jagged rhythm like The Fall. So I kept wondering what this band sounded like. I finally saw the video for Kicker Conspiracy on Much Music City Limits, a strange early 80s video on a soccer pitch with angular guitar sounds and a shouted non-melodic chorus. I was intrigued, but did not know what to make of it. Months later, I decided to buy the compilation album Palace of Swords Reversed. The opening track, Prole Art Threat, immediately grabbed my attention. The shouted lyrics and off-kilter guitar I found fascinating. The lyrics were strange and I had no clue what they were about. But being a fan of music that was noisy and dissonant, I knew this was up my alley. The next song, How I Wrote Elastic Man, I found really annoying and fast-forwarded it on my cassette player to the next track. Totally Wired, with its pulsating beat, was definitely up my alley. However, I started to lose interest over the next few songs. By the time I got to Kicker Conspiracy on side two, I'd come to the conclusion that this tape was not bad, but was not going to be in my heavy play rotation. But I would occasionally put this tape on. Slowly over time, the music began to creep into my unconsciousness. This sound was unique and cerebral. At the time, I did not really know the reference points that were being made musically. I was listening to a wide range of music that included indie rock, alternative metal, punk, hardcore, and some noise music. This sound was very different from any of these. It was also different from the other British post-punk I was familiar with, like Joy Division, Bauhaus, and Killing Joke. These obtuse rhythms and surreal lyrics painted a unique landscape in my mind. The singer ranted about city hobgoblins and traveling back in time to the U.S. Civil War. In one song, which began with the cheapest sounding electronic beat, the singer commands the rest of the band to turn that bloody blimey space invader off. Immediately, the annoying pulsating beat ceases and the obtuse guitars begin to create a rhythmic wave. By the time I entered university, The Fall had creeped enough into my unconsciousness to become my favorite band. Most people did not really take to The Fall when I played it for them, and I probably became insufferable trying to insist why this band was so great. It took years, but they eventually came around. The story of The Fall goes back to the working class Salford area of Manchester in the mid-1970s. Mark E. Smith started listening to music at 14 and developed eclectic tastes that were influenced by John Peel's radio show, Black Sabbath's Paranoid album, Can, The Velvet Underground, Captain Beefheart, Garage 60 groups like The Seeds, 
early rock and rollers like Gene Vincent and reggae. Mark was also an avid reader, knowing that the one book that he really enjoyed reading at school was Thomas Hardy's Mayor of Casterbridge. But he also consumed the fantasy and science fiction of Edgar Allan Poe, H.P. Lovecraft, Philip K. Dick, Colin Wilson, Clark Ashton Smith, Arthur McCheon, M.R. James, and Algernon Blackwood. The hard-boiled detective fiction of Raymond Chandler, literary heavyweights like Malcolm Lowry, the poetry of Ezra Pound, and the experimental writing of Wyndham Lewis. All of these literary influences would stew together and help Smith develop what he described as a unique approach to writing. After getting laid off as a dock worker, Smith hooked up with others to try and find an outlet for his writing through music. A key event happened that Smith likes to downplay, which was the Sex Pistols gig at the Lesser Free Trade Hall in 1976. After that gig, he started to put together a band where initially he was the guitarist. They started out as The Outsiders, named after the novel by Albert Camus. Smith preferred the canoe novel The Fall, so the name changed. Soon Smith was on vocals, and as Smith states, they realized that their true mission was to be in The Fall. The early lineup of The Fall included Smith, Martin Brahma, Tony Friel, Carl Burns, and girlfriend Una Baines. Their first gigs were part of a Manchester art collective where anybody could go up on stage and play. They shared the stage with brass bands and a man who created compositions with samples of bird noises. Soon they were able to get gigs opening up for the Buzzcocks, whose manager funded the first recordings of the fall. Bingo Masters Breakout was recorded in November 1977, but did not end up getting released until August 1978. By that time, Friel and Baines had quit beginning this long tradition of revolving lineups of the fall. The first album, Live at the Witch Trials, was released in March 1979. By this time, eager 16-year-old Mark Riley had joined the band, much to the annoyance of the other members. Recorded in one day, the album contains surprisingly clean-sounding guitars playing dirgy rhythms with Smith barking on about a variety of subjects, including drug paranoia, lack of decent jobs for the working class, and the shallowness of the music industry. Smith's lyrics would describe the mundane aspects and dialogue of everyday life juxtaposed with grotesque surrealism, all the time dripping with cynicism and sarcasm. These complex rants would always circle back to a repetitive chorus. Smith's vocal approach was not to sing, but rather to shout. In the song, Your Heart Out, from the album Dragnet, Smith declares, I don't sing, I just shout. The Manchurian cadence of his vocal delivery would result in many lines ending with an enunciated, ah. The band soon got the attention of maverick British DJ John Peel, who would invite them to record Peel sessions at his studio. This first recording would begin the beginning of a long relationship and The Fall would record more Peel sessions than any other music group or artist. Two other significant factors during this time period were the exit of founding member Martin Brahma, who had accepted the fact that Smith was the clear leader of the group and they would never again be on equal footing. The other factor was Smith's new girlfriend, Kay Carroll, taking on the role of manager. Her aggressive tactics would frighten many promoters. In October 1979, Dragnet was released on Step Forward Records. This album was much more gritty and lo-fi in production than its predecessor. On the opening track, Smith asks, Is there anybody there? An angular guitar riff prances around for a few bars before the listener is overwhelmed in a dissonant cacophony of rockabilly rhythms. Many of the songs are dirgy, sinister tirades of paranoia, such as A Figure Walks or Before the Moon Falls. It was on this album that Smith began to solidify his vision, a British working-class band that played a kind of avant-garage music that was just as much rockabilly and skiffle as it was Can and Captain Beefheart. 
This album marked the debuts of both bassist Stephen Hanley and guitarist Craig Scallion, two stalwarts who would remain with Smith for many years to come. The band would sign to Rough Trade in 1980, and they would release two seminal albums, Grotesque After the Gram and The Slates EP. On the Grotesque EP, the listener is introduced to Joe Total, the yet unborn son, who will lead a rebellious northern army against the elite in southern England in the epic song The North Will Rise Again. On the album, Smith comments on people saying he rips off Johnny Rotten, British workers making money in Europe, and the contrast between intellectuals and the working class. A good mind don't make a good pub mate. Slate's contains the great song Pearl Art Threat. But the Fall were also releasing Signals regularly, and in 1980, they released Totally Wired. Smith describes the effects of being on amphetamines, a drug that Smith would use and abuse until his death. The song describes Smith being irate, peeved, and worried after drinking a jar of coffee and taking some of these. In the live version, he would quote Hunter S. Thompson, when the going get weird, the weird turn pro. The Fall made their first tour of the United States in 1981, which was captured on the album Part of America Therein, 1981. The LP starts with the band being introduced as From the Riot-Torn Streets of Manchester, England to the Scenic Sewers of Chicago. The band was developing a following stateside among college radio listeners and more open-minded hardcore punk fans. The band would go on to record what many Fall fans consider to be their greatest album, at least of their early albums, in 1982, Hex Induction Hour. Smith was becoming frustrated by the Rough Trade label and did not want to be pigeonholed as a Rough Trade band. The band would release the single lie dream of a casino soul on the small label camera records the group would end up recording the first of the tracks of hex induction hour on their travels to iceland a track in the album would actually be named after the country and the fall would build a serious fan base there the band's lineup now included two drummers adding to the rhythmic cacophony of the tracks the production was purposely lo-fi and the influence of the velvet underground can and captain beefart were on full display. Smith was making a statement uh, against what was happening at the time. As Smith states, when you're mired in the stuff of the times with bland bastards like Elvis Costello and Spando Ballet, you start to question not only people's tastes, but their existences. You're not going to go anywhere with all that stuff. I wanted an album to be like reading a really good book. You have a couple of beers, sit down and immerse yourself. The album cover was a bunch of scribbled notes and a small picture of abstract art, which caused many record stores to place the album in the back of the display stacks. The aesthetic of both the cover and the music would later be influential on 90s indie rockers Pavement. Smith would later dismiss them as mere ripoff artists. The slow plodding hit priest would later be heard when Clarice Starling, played by Jodie Foster, confronts Buffalo Bill in his den of horrors in Jonathan Demme's film Silence of the Lambs. Who knew that serial killers were Fall fans? But not everything was going well in the Fall camp. Tension had been brewing between Mark Riley and Smith. Riley tried to speak up against Smith's tyrannical rule, while Smith simply felt that Riley wanted to play the hits every night. After recording the LP Room to Live, the band would go on tour of New Zealand, another country where the fall developed a serious following, and Australia. Riley would end up punching Smith on that tour. Smith's black eye can be seen on an Australian TV interview with both him and Riley sitting there with a ton of tension between them. When they got back to Euro England, Riley would get the sack indirectly. Smith would tell him that the band were going, on, going to tour Europe and that Smith did not want Riley to go. But he would call Riley if things didn't work out with his replacement. Riley never received that call.
According to Smith, Riley was fired for dancing to Deep Purple Smoke on the Water at his own wedding. With the fall, the truth is always obscured. Things would end up taking a different turn for the fall on their 1983 tour of the United States. Tune in next week's episode to see how an American girl would impact Smith's vision of the fall. Thank you for listening to Exhumed. Tune in for next episode for part two of Marky Smith and the Fall.